So I don't think that there, that there will come another person. Uh, so I welcome you to this session, to this session, services for the blind. <coughs> there is one person missing, Mr. Kawamura. Perhaps we will join um, during the session. But we have two another persons uh, presenting uh, that are not on the list. My name is Klaus Höckner. <coughs> I'm uh, wearing several hats. I'm the, ah, here's Mr. Kawamura. <laughs> Last but not least. <laughs> Your place is free. <laughs> I'm the uh, chair of the Austrian Association supporting the blind and visually impaired. Uh, it has a funny uh, German name. It's the Hilfsgemeinschaft der Blinden und Sehschwachen Österreichs. It's you can translate it literally into English, yeah. And I'm uh, also in the board of the Austrian Disability Forum, which is an umbrella organization for uh, 80, more than 80 organizations in Austria dealing in the field of persons with disabilities. <clears throat> I'm now more than 20 years in the field of information and communication, communication technology and persons with disabilities. Uh, and we have a very distinguished panel here uh, from all over the world uh, presenting different solutions uh, <clears throat> for blind and visually impaired persons. Uh, we have at least three uh, presenters from Israel uh, which are presenting different things. <clears throat> from Israel here we have uh, one uh, presenter from Austria next to me. Uh, and we have uh, from Japan, uh, Mr. Kawamura. He was the last one to enter the to enter the session. Yes. <coughs> so I'm sorry for my voice, uh, but as you have noticed, the weather isn't so good in Austria at the moment. <laughs> uh, for technical uh, technical aspects, every uh, presenter has nine minutes. Uh, after the nine minutes. <coughs> A red light would flash up here in front of the in front of my desk, or, and you will have you will have a, a sound. I do think too. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we have to to break up after nine minutes, but we have enough time <clears throat> after the sessions to discuss about the different aspects that are presented here. I think uh, information and communication technology uh, is one of the main drivers for uh, more. Uh, independent life uh, for a person with disabilities, especially for a person uh, with a visual impairment or for a blind person. Uh, and we've seen a massive improvement in this field within the last 20 years with the upcoming of the internet, with the upcoming of the ICT, with the upcoming of apps and so on. Nobody could imagine ever that a blind person would use a smartphone as they are using it uh, at the moment. <clears throat> Uh, I know so many people using the smartphone uh, being totally or uh, legally blind <clears throat> and uh, computers also. Uh, one of the most simple aspects uh, I always mention when I'm presenting uh, about ICT and person with disabilities is a very simple example, the example of a book uh, in former times when you when there was no e-book, when there was no possibility to read out loud books, <clears throat> to, you had to have a second person to read out loud the book. And uh, if, you want, if, if the second person didn't want to read more uh, or stops, to re stops reading, you had to wait for uh, another person or you had to wait till this person want, or another person wants to, wants to help you again. Nowadays, a blind person can sit in the bath tube or can sit in the, in the tube or in the tram or anywhere. <clears throat> listening the book that they want. Uh, and that's one of the aspects that we also have here uh, in, in uh, our presentation. That means the end of the book famine uh, because of uh, legal, uh, because, of the hin because of hindering legal uh, boundaries that, that we have. Now with the Marrakesh Treaty, I hope all will be, will be better in the future. Yeah? And we have more books for blind and visually impaired persons uh, at the disposition for them. Uh, <clears throat> and Mopius, for example, as I, as I mentioned before, the 
Karl Pletschke, who is sitting next to me, uh, he will present us about a very important, a very interesting thing uh, about a menu uh, that is spoken out loud, for example. Uh, and for me, it is one example of a spin-off because uh, it's not only for blind and visual impaired, for persons with disabilities, uh, it's also for uh, the mainstream. Yes. Yeah? Uh, and I think one of the most important things is uh, that we have applications that are designed for all persons and not designed especially for the target group of persons with disabilities, uh, because when we design it for all, uh, they can be used by all persons, and we will see that there are some economic background and there's an economic success also, which is one of the main reasons for persons uh, setting up projects, setting up <coughs> several uh, companies and so on. Yeah. So let's start now, uh, because time is restricted. Uh, let's start with Abbas Abbas. Abbas Abbas is uh, the founder and director of Al Manara. Is, is, or, Almanara. Almanara, yeah. The lighthouse, yeah. It's the same name uh, than Migdal Or. Uh, one in Arabic and, and one in Arabic, the, the other in Hebrew, yeah. <laughs> Abbas is a social entrepreneur with a vision to change the world for persons with disabilities in the Arab community and in other communities as well. Mm -hmm. Abbas has had a visual disability since birth. He received his bachelor and master's degree in law and a second master in business management, specializing in non-profit management. In 2009, he was selected as the first Ashoka innovator uh, for the public fellow in Israel. Yeah. So the floor is yours now. Thank you very much. Okay. By the way, I'm a victim of the cold weather of Austria. Just yesterday arrived, I got a cold. So, let's start like this. Um, the famous social activist and, and writer, Helen Keller said, life is either daring adventure or nothing. So, she is inspired in, in one of the person who inspired me uh, to establish Almanara in 2005 uh, with the cooperation of uh, people with this uh, active people with disabilities, and uh, we founded Almanara to become as the first organization of its kind in the Arab society, who focus in promoting the person as a person, uh, in uh, promoting the rights of people with disabilities as equal, uh, to develop their rights uh, to awareness to raise awareness for their rights and to empower them and to, def to, to uh, defend on their rights. So this is the uh, background. And later I want to discuss about the need of the Almanara's International Accessible Library. First, as a social entrepreneur, uh, it was my personal story I wanted access books, and uh, when I, since my childhood, my parents helped me. But when I founded Almanara and learned from the experience of others, like the Library of the Congress and other li international libraries, uh, what about creating a platform, mainly in Arabic, especially that there is a huge lack of a books, accessible books in, in Arabic, and so that we started uh, to make making uh, thousands of uh, accessible books, and this will lead to develop the persons and to uh, facilitate their integration in the uh, academic uh, studies and the labor uh, market. So how we did this? How, yes, next. How was the solution? By creating or developing a website titled www.arabcast.org. Actually, a, we took the, from the word podcast, a, instead of pod, we put Arab, and so we have the Arabcast domain. And following, follow the website followed by mobile app titled Arabcast or 
Almanara uh, library, uh, and uh, the mobile app are uh, accessible for all the range of uh, uh, accessibilities. And here I will show you a, a sample of uh, the, uh, vo our voice artists. Actually, the library includes also electronic books, but I do believe that um, listening to a read a audio books by human being, it's so enjoyable and uh, so beneficiary. Uh, and uh, in addition to our local readers, we have readers from Arab countries like uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, uh, Palestinian authorities, and others. Again? Yes, uh, so uh, as I said, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the Almanara uh, International Library, and then I want to uh, go to the uh, credits and awards, yeah? Again? Yes, yes, I mentioned that. Uh, I said that we have a uh, local readers, uh, from Israel, from the Arab society, and we have international voice artists from uh, several countries, as I mentioned, Egypt, Jordan, even Libya, Syria. And then let's move to the, uh, uh, some facts. I want to share with you some facts about, the, I guess, some uh, data and facts about the library. Uh, fortunately, the library pro uh, formally was established in 2014. Since 2014, we have more than 5,000 uh, recorded and e electronic uh, books. Uh, we have over 50,000 recorded hours, and uh, we have over 30 titles from children books, novels, uh, in all the fields, uh, science, medicine, technology, health, etc. And uh, since its establishment, we have over three million users. And oh, I forgot to mention that we have a 80,000 unique users who are a subscribers of Albanara Library. Three and minutes. what? Three minutes. And we have a three million visitors since its, its establishment, and monthly we have more than two, two, uh, 200,000 uh, visitors. So you can see that, uh, that this project is growing and growing, and uh, the sky is the limit. And uh, let's uh, share with you with some credits and awards uh, that uh, Almanara received. So. Uh, Almanara received uh, the best uh, initiative for promoting reading and contribution to the community of knowledge. Uh, we received a prestigious award by, uh, by the governor of Dubai, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid uh, Al Maktoum, which titled the Arabic Language Award. We received it last uh, uh, May in 2017, and I went to Dubai. And I want to share you with a very, very special story that we received a phone call from a Syrian refugee who lives in Europe, and she is a mother of three blind children, and she was so appreciative and she, expressing, she was expressing her appreciation to the library and to the great benefit to their uh, three blind children. Actually, when I received this phone call and heard the story, I was really so excited and even cried. It was so, so exciting. Hey, uh, later, I want to share with you uh, how we could gain the sustainability of this project. So uh, we are uh, planning uh, to uh, create a Almanara library as a social business so we can develop the library and make it uh, yani more, uh, to increase more and more audiobooks and to make it more and more uh, exposed to more people. And uh, another mechanism to uh, a, 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 to uh, develop the library is we thought about idea of 
crowd readers, like, you know, the uh, term of crowdfunding, we said we want to uh, let more and more people from all the world to contribute for us and to share their uh, material or their audio material uh, to arabcast.org and to the mobile app and so that we can have um, thousands of additional thousands of titles and and uh, how we are promoting and uh, the next step as i mentioned we want to increase our voice artists and now you know the technology of mobile apps is developing so we are planning to upgrade our library uh, and uh, through uh, upgrading the website and the mobile app and in addition we are developing a three new professional recorded uh, recording uh, studios in Nazareth and uh, uh, one of the recording studio will create podcasts uh, so I want to uh, uh, finish my words to say this library is beacon uh, for persons with print disabilities but not only and we do believe and we dream that this library could be bridge of peace and hope between nations thank you very much so Abba, thank you very much for this uh, for this impressive uh, documentation and presentation uh, one question from my side uh, what about the titles? What about uh, the problem of, of getting getting the books? Where do you get the books? It's all. You Actually, know. we have a committee. A, we call it a repertoire committee of professionals who select to books. To the back. Uh, sorry, no, no, in front of you. Uh, okay. So again, uh, we have a, a repertoire committee by professionals who <laughs> help us to select. Uh, the book, uh, but also we uh, run a, a surveys uh, for our readers uh, uh, also to receive what they want to be recorded. Uh, our motto is to make the library uh, as much as various of many, many and uh, of uh, books so that it could be uh, meet all the desires uh, the, the, all the desires of all the uh, users of the library okay. thank you for the audience uh, two questions Please. yes thank you again how did you manage to make accessible the books of exact science as chemistry or physics or mathematics? Ah, okay, this is an interesting question. Uh, actually, we don't yani, put, uh, re record the equations on all, all the stuff. We, we put yani, science books about facts or in science, for example, what are the main inventions and all the stuff. Actually, this is one of the things that uh, people who are blind studying at schools we are facing, uh, they are facing especially uh, for accessing their math uh, books and all the stuff. Actually, it is a very, very challenging issue, especially in Israel. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the other questions, I, I would ask you to, to, notice, to, to note the questions on your, on your paper and uh, after all the presentations, we, mm -hmm. we should have enough time to, to make uh, okay. another round of, of, of questions. Yeah. And I'm sorry for my uh, sickness. It <clears throat> was come out of the blue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no problem. Really? Yeah. So let's pass over to the next one. Uh, next one is Karl Plechko. Karl Plechko is the chairman <clears throat> of a company uh, situated here in, in Vienna. He was born in Klagenfurt in the southern part of Austria. He has a master's degree in business economics of the Vienna University of Economics, Telematics and E-Business Management from Danube University of Krems and some other titles which I don't mention here. <laughs> and he will present us Mopius. <clears throat> he worked for several years in the telecommunication and digitalization business industry for companies like Nokia, A1, A1 is the Austrian uh, 
telephone company here, uh, Telecom Austria and others. He loves technology and is passionate about making great things happen, uh, things that matter to people and improve their everyday lives. And you will see it's an everyday life <coughs> thing that we are now presented. Uh, Thank you, Klaus. The floor is yours. Very nice words. Um, I don't know, can you already see my slides? Not no. yet. Um, Mopius, who are we? Well, Klaus mentioned a little bit about um, what I did before. So till 2012, I was in the telecommunication industry, maybe focused on mobile technology. So everything that has to do with mobile sensoring, mobile uh, sensor-based solution, working for Nokia on international level. And in 2012, I founded a company together with my colleagues there as well outside. Um, mainly focused on third-party app development based on sensors technologies like Bluetooth, like GPS, like near-field communication and all these kind of things. We did a lot of research projects in the past, mainly related to how to interpret data generated from mobile smartphone in certain specific use cases for end users and how to engage uh, end users on that. It was at a time when I met a visually impaired person and um, he impressed me so much um, that um, during our endeavor, I don't know, I think, I think the remote is not working. Can you? Oh, no, no. Okay. During our endeavor in, in the first year since we founded uh, the company, we won a lot of let's say, local and international industry awards. And one industry award was as well very important for us because next week there's the Mobile World Congress going on as well in Barcelona. And in 2013, we won the Mobile uh, World Congress award for a service which was called at the time Nearspeak. And just to give you a short overview of what Nearspeak was, it was mainly utilizing the technology speak recognition, attaching the recognized uh, speech to a certain specific sensor, and another person could uh, easily, uh, let's say, with his smartphone, attach the sensor and listen to the recorded voice in his uh, own language. It was extremely difficult for us to bring this technology down to earth because nobody uh, had so-called use cases how to really use that. And it, it was the time where I, I met a visually impaired person. And he impressed me so much that, well, we are having a technology in our hand and he's having some kind of, I wouldn't say disabilities, <coughs> but he's having special needs. Um, and we um, found out that there are two, let's say, areas where visually impaired are heavily handicapped from the normal world. The one is getting out to a restaurant and discover the menu cards there. And the second one is a simple one that is shopping. Because visually impaired people cannot really go uh, into a supermarket, discover the certain specific things of different kind of milks or different kind of yogurt or whatever. So um, then we said, well, Let's do something for the, the, the first thing that has to do with uh, eating out. Getting eating out, getting in a coffee, getting in a restaurant, and discovering uh, the menu card. And um, as we are, let's say, technology focused, we are mainly focusing on, on the so-called Bluetooth technology. Um, we developed a solution which is mainly or it's not again going mainly usable for visually impaired, but as Klaus mentioned before, the, the uh, menu card itself is a digitized menu card where everybody can use it. So um, the main problem for visually impaired is when they are getting in a restaurant, they don't even know that there is a menu card there no there is uh, no menu card in their languages and the sad thing is especially here in Vienna I don't know if you already discovered some 
uh, restaurants or coffees here in Vienna, a lot of the waiters are very rude and sometimes they are ignoring people as well. Um, I, I've heard from some... Uh, <laughs> well, I've heard that in some tourist guide uh, it's already written that uh, the, the waiters are, and that's typical Austrian, but it's definitely not. I, it's a well, welcome uh, here. So, um, so we came up with a solution called MenuSpeak, and the MenuSpeak solution is a barrier-free, multi-language uh, menu application, which means that it, once you're entering, I don't know where to put, once you're entering with your uh, mobile ap uh, application, the menu spec application, a certain specific restaurant, you get the menu card fully digitized uh, on iOS and Android platforms in, and it's fully accessible which means that it adapts to the user settings. So whatever uh, the user, the visually impaired one is having set in his mobile phone, either the the speed of, of the, the voice or the magnifier mode, the application is fully adaptive to these settings. Uh, we're currently supporting 55 different languages, which means that the menu card is uh, automatically on the fly translated into this different language from the user. The restaurants should only provide um, either one or two languages, mainly German and, and English now. And it's a technology framework which we call mobile engagement and proximity platform because it engages Bluetooth technology, like I mentioned before. But the, not only, we are also getting as well GPS technology where, for example, we can guide if a visually impaired people is close to some restaurant, we can guide them to the restaurants as well. So, uh, just to give you a, f a few numbers, uh, we have currently rolled out here in Vienna. We do have uh, 22 restaurants, coffees and hotels uh, here in Vienna and some of them uh, outside of Vienna. Some of them are very famous as you see here and later before, uh, later as well. Um, some key numbers, we launched 2017 in April last year, we had 2,500, more than 2,500 customers with around, 2, 5, uh, with around 5,000 visits, and they are coming from 28 different countries. Um, the service is available for the hotels uh, for free, um, so there is just a one-time fee of 99 euro, and the first uh, restaurants who will come to our booth or if you know a restaurant who is interested in and uh, who will come to our booth, will get as well the beacon for free. Um, so they don't have to spend these 99 euro for the beacon and there are no monthly fees included. So that's mainly it. Thank you. Thank you for being in time. <laughs> I think was it? Red? Yeah, it was okay. in time. Yeah, it started to flash red. <laughs> so, uh, okay, because as, as I understood it, um, we need a beacon. How many beacons do we need uh, when when we when we want to have the service? We need it in every room, or it's it's enough if you have one beacon. I, I think it it really depends on the the size of the venue. Uh, just to give you an example, for this area or this <coughs> size of the room, normally one beacon is enough. Um, um, we do have restaurants who are having separated rooms, either a, a coffee area and an eating area. They sometimes do need two or three. It really depends. Mm -hmm. We do have as well a very large hotel group. It's Grand Hotel. I think they are having on the different floors uh, some kind of restaurant. So they do have four or five beacons in this in this restaurants. Not that many. But I do, not, I do, I do have to have uh, the the app. I have to uh, first. Yep. I have to download the app, and then for, for now, I yes, a push, a push notice or not? Yeah, for now you still need to install an application um, because um, an application needs to, let's say, trigger this uh, signaling, the Bluetooth signaling, so that you <coughs> receive an automatic uh, push notification. 
uh, but we are working as well with other companies uh, in the field that uh, we are combining a so-called geofence technology and trigger the, uh, let's say, the geofences to uh, notify people about uh, menu cards in this area without pre-installing. It's a so-called, uh, on Android, so-called so Android Go mode, which is a semi, semi uh, combination of an application installed and using the browser, which is uh, built in. Question? No question? Okay, <clears throat> let's pass over to Israel, to Gabi Cohen, uh, to, the another light, to the other lighthouse that we have. Yeah. Gabi uh, is from Israel, from uh, Migdalor. <clears throat> he is a computer engineer with 24, 25 years of work experience in global high-tech companies, a software developer and manager and as director of customer support and IT. In 2013, he made a career change and has joined Migdalor to manage uh, its tr transitional employment center. And he was nominated in 2015 as director of Migdalor Call Center. And he is telling us about uh, the call center for blind and visually impaired users uh, and digital assistive technology in Israel, I think in Haifa. You are sitting in Haifa. Yes. The floor is yours. Thank you, Klaus. Good afternoon, everyone. <coughs> Migdalor. Oh, is it on? Migdalor is a multi-service center dedicated to advancing blind and visually impaired people in uh, independent functioning and inclusion in the workplace. Uh, we are active for 60 years in Israel. And uh, we provide services to uh, around 3,000 people each year in all ages and sectors uh, all around Israel. It's a continuum uh, services. Most of our services are founded uh, by the government. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, accessibility, what it takes to have accessible digital uh, systems. So there are four uh, building blocks here. We have the technology, skills, and uh, deployment, which means if you have all three of them, it means the developers have the technology and know-how uh, in order to build accessible systems and they also implement it. So, for example, if they develop a website, they can they develop an accessible website. Um, this is one side of this. The other side is uh, for the users, for blind and visually impaired people. They need to have the technology to access those systems, the skills to do that, and uh, and once all those three uh, elements, the building blocks, are here, it looks like we are all set. Okay, you have accessible website or information system or a mobile application, uh, so what can go wrong? Um, so we have found out in our experience, over many years' experience, that there is one critical uh, thing that is uh, missing. And, and this is... Uh, this is support. Okay, so what happens once uh, uh, in an ideal world, everything is set, and now I'm, need, I, I'm a blind person, for example, and I need to, uh, to access the systems. So working for a blind person or a visually impaired person, working on a, a, on a computer without a screen monitor and without a mouse, it's extremely difficult. The skills you need to, uh, uh, to have and, uh, uh, is, really, is really, really extreme. And in order to work efficiently, you need to everyday practice to do that. And, uh, and the issue is that in any place, at workplace, the IT, uh, technical staff, or help desk, 
the helpline of, uh, of any companies that help using devices like mobile devices or uh, internet, uh, in, uh, internet uh, websites. Once a, a blind person calls them, they don't know how to help them. And we found out that uh, people, although they have all, everything is set in Israel, most of the website, or many websites are accessible, people are not using them because once they need help, uh, if there's no one to help them, after one, two, three times, they give up and don't, uh, and don't use it anymore. And uh, also the technology is always uh, advanced. There are new things, new versions, new features, Someone needs to help people uh, get this knowledge. And the solution that we uh, came up with is a te technical support call center for blind and visually impaired uh, people. They can call in, no charge, and get assistance for their assistive te technology and for working with devices or with uh, uh, digital systems. A few things to note here is one, all the service uh, representatives are legally blind, okay? And the reason is that they are using the, this technology daily and they are the best people to provide support. Another thing is that we uh, provide support in three languages, the common, the most popular languages in Israel Hebrew, Arabic, and Russian. And it's, okay. And it's, it's operated already for four years. The impact, we provide uh, support for about 1,000 people each year, growing in 10% uh, every year. And we get about 7,000 uh, income calls every year. So this is really has a, a lot of uh, impact. Um, in the surveys that we conducted three years ago, two years ago, 70% um, of the uh, 70% of the uh, people say, said that uh, the call center improves their love, life quality significantly, and 84% claimed that uh, their performance at work is improved significantly due to the uh, call center. You can see that also almost 50% of the calls are for mobile devices and applications. Uh, how we sustain this service, so we have some agreement with a few, with few uh, organizations, the Social Security, uh, National so Social Security uh, of Israel, the uh, Ministry of Education, we provide support to pupils, their parents and teachers, and the health insurance, uh, the biggest health insurance uh, company. And uh, we also provide uh, uh, support for uh, devices like Orcam and uh, NVDA, is an Israeli project, uh, uh, NVDA uh, screen reader. And I get some funding from National Social Security. So some of the challenges that we have, I think the biggest ones that I want to talk about now, because it's short of time, is cloning or replicating this model to other uh, countries. We believe this is a critical uh, element in order for people to effectively use digital systems and integrate it in society. And we believe that this can be or should be uh, duplicated. We believe that we are the first one to do that. And also to have, uh, to have agreement and market this uh, inside Israel so uh, people will be able to access more uh, systems. Okay, so I'm done. I will, we will be happy to assist uh, in building those services and answer questions.
Thank you. Thank you, Gabi. Thank you, Gabi. Uh, one question. So <laughs> it means if I, if I have a smartphone and I don't know how to use this smartphone, I can call you. If I'm blind or visually impaired and I have some, some app that I downloaded and I want to use it and I don't know how to use it, I can call, can, can call your service. Well, if you live in Israel, um, we provide, <laughs> I could try we, provide uh, we provide uh, <laughs> training for, uh, for people all over Israel how to use their computers and mobile devices. So they need to have the basic know-how how to use the devices. Now, if there is a new application or something new, we will guide you through the uh, call center. Okay. okay. Is there any question from the audience? No, okay. So let's pass over. Uh, thematically, we are, <coughs> we are again uh, with books, with reading books, yeah. uh, with Hiroshi Kawamura, who will tell us about <coughs> the Marrakesh Treaty and beyond. Hiroshi is the founder, past president, and current board member of the DAISY Consortium and the global chair of the ICTA Rehabilitation International. I think DAISY should yes. be. Uh, uh, I think that <clears throat> most of the people know here in this room, he helped to implement DAISY throughout Japan in 1998 to 20, 2002. And as part of the DAISY for All project funded by the Nippon Foundation, he successfully transferred DAISY technology to Thailand, India, and Bangladesh and served as a <clears throat> disability focal point for United Nations WSIS. 2003 to 2005, as well as for the Third World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction in Sendai 2015. Currently, he is working for information accessibility standards implementation in developing countries in collaboration with the Japan International Cooperation Agency. The floor is yours, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I'd like to talk about uh, the Marrakesh Treaty and beyond it. Okay. So um, probably you know Marrakesh Treaty, but uh, to make sure, I'd like to uh, briefly outline it. Uh, World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, in short, WIPO, is the owner of this international treaty. The Marrakesh Treaty is to facilitate access to published works for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled. The main goal of the treaty is to create a set of mandatory limitations and exceptions for the benefit of the blind, visually impaired, and otherwise print disabled. And there is an official website at the WIPO uh, site. And currently, there are 34 ratified countries around the world. Uh, they con uh, consist of the assembly member, uh, um, they consist an assembly. And there is a accessible book consortium, um, ABC in short, uh, which is the actual implementation body um, established under WIPO. Uh, oh, <laughs> okay. So uh, then uh, the WIPO um, treaty uh, has uh, Article 3, which defines a beneficiary of uh, this treaty. Uh, who are benefit uh, from this treaty, uh, which is very important? Of course, blind people and visually impaired people. But a very significant impact of this treaty um, is the fact that it includes otherwise print disabled people. Uh, which is a wide variety of disability community. So the interpretation uh, could be different from country to country, depending on 
their copyright situation. In Japan, we interpret it um, to include um, those people with cognitive disability, intellectual disability, um, the, um, those with physical disability, and also uh, the um, who has temporary uh, disease which prevent uh, from reading uh, books. So it's really wide range of people so far segregated from reading could be introduced in this category of beneficiaries in our interpretation. And um, apparently, those who cannot hold uh, books or turn pages are also included in this uh, beneficiaries. So this is significant change of uh, the uh, copyright limitations and exceptions so far. Um, this is uh, the, okay. Um, the treaty creates a harmonization of uh, conflicting rights. Rights of copyright holders and rights of persons with disabilities on access to information. And harmonization is set out by this treaty. Um, how to harmonize it is uh, very important. And so far, there are several standards and technology development which uh, gives us the opportunity to make uh, the provision of accessible uh, alternative uh, information to be published as uh, the reasonable accommodation. Without such technical advancement, uh, this treaty is not uh, agreed upon. Currently, DAISY, Digital Accessible Information System, and the most current version of DAISY, which is called EPUB, EPUB with EPUB Accessibility 1.0, um, are the most significant um, standards for accessible electronic publishing. And there are accessible PDF and uh, other related tools for reading, uh, including screen readers, text-to-speech engine, and braille display. Uh, those are the uh, set of uh, technologies that support the implementation of uh, the Marrakesh Treaty. So the next step, the Marrakesh Treaty doesn't address rights of access to broadcasting and motion pictures. It's very important. In the broadband age, um, it is a nightmare for blind people to have uh, motion pictures more and more on the website. And uh, the scientific um, and professional readings in electronic format may have um, more combined motion pictures. And in particular, in the education process, motion pictures are being introduced um, more and more. So the solution uh, for technology is a synchronization of texts and motion pictures that I would like to address um, as a solution. The still graphics has a alternative text. Motion pictures should have synchronized alternative text and also audio description. And currently, uh, there is an initiative of light version of synchronized multimedia integration language uh, to be conducted by World Wide Web Consortium and International Telecommunication Union is the hope uh, to solve these techn technical issues to make uh, the 
uh, motion pictures more accessible. So you can download and evaluate uh, the accessible multimedia uh, when you Google with uh, the uh, keywords, with the keywords um, HLMDD, high level meeting uh, on um, disability or something. <laughs> I forgot the DD. But uh, HLMDD is uh, the jargon um, you can find. Uh, the outcome document of the. This direction. This, this direction. Oh. Okay, here. Okay, so please find it and um, you can uh, manipulate by yourself uh, if you find uh, the multimedia version of this outcome document, which is synchronized sign language presentation of the full text. Uh, and uh, full human narration of the text. So all those are synchronized. Okay. So uh, the IPTV accessibility guidelines is a very new international standard set out by ITUT, and which is called H.702. Uh, of course, you can check uh, this ITU standard with the ITU website. So in conclusion, uh, the Marrakesh Treaty is a significant step um, towards the really, um, in real inclusion of all types of people with disabilities who are segregated from the reading of the books so far. But we need to move forward beyond that. And after or um, at the same time of the implementation, we should address uh, the next step, which is the inclusion of motion picture access. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kawamura. Um, one question. You, you mentioned the Marrakesh Treaty should be um, a step forward uh, for blind and visually impaired persons, especially for blind persons. Uh, which percentage of books is now available, available uh, in uh, in EPUB e or in DAISY format for blind persons worldwide? So uh, the ABC has developed a international exchange system of uh, the uh, accessible alternative publication. At the moment, uh, it has uh, 300,000 300, titles, but uh, it will increase. Um, I estimate at least one million titles around the world is already published in alternative format, including DAISY and accessible EPUB. Question from the audience. Nope. Okay. So let's come to something completely different. No. <laughs> to Linda. <laughs> we're going. We're going to the uh, to the field of culture. Linda uh, is based in Vienna, but uh, she works for a French design agency, Tactile Studio, which offers museums. Uh, and, and creative, inclusive, inclusive approach to cultural mediation. She joined the team from Textile Studio in 2016 uh, after completing a master in art history and having collected several, several work experiences in museums and art galleries in New York, Paris, and Berlin. And she told me now she's working with the university in Bordeaux. Yeah. That means she's also uh, speaking French. Uh, at Tactile Studio, she is the first contact for a museum that wants to become more accessible with more or less concrete ideas. Her personal interest is also a doctoral research project focuses on relief images of visual art and the possibilities of universal design to deliver an aesthetic experience of art. And we are working now together, and we're working together with her to make, for example, Vienna, the first district, and here some <clears throat> some some buildings uh, more accessible, and I think she will tell us about this. Linda, the floor is yours. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I will try to speak as fast as possible. And um, so let me try first if this works here well. Oh. Okay, great. Accessibility in museums today is an imperative requirement covered by Article 27 of the 1948 Declaration of Human Rights and addressed in the EU as part of the European Strategy 2020 for Disabled People. It is a right which has been increasingly ratified in legal systems. Still, efforts to expand accessibility often still concern the physical accessibility of buildings. But unrestricted access to qualified, participatory and collaborative educational experiences is an equally important subject. How do we make museum experience accessible to all visitors? The notion of universal design has become increasingly more important in the exhibition making process. The aim of universal design is to address all users and including those who have long-term physical, mental, intellectual and sensory impairments. It helps visitors develop comfort and confidence within the museum space. Um, I'm sorry. So this is us. Um, Tacta Studio is a French entrepreneur for universal design in arts and culture. We've been founded in 2009 and um, have since realized more than 400 inclusive projects with France's biggest and state-owned museums like the Louvre, Chateau de Versailles, um, and uh, also recently the Louvre Abu Dhabi. And international, we are represented here in Vienna, in Italy, in the UK, and in Germany. The most recent project, as I mentioned before, has been a touch circuit for the Louvre Abu Dhabi, and I will show you some pictures after this. Um, so what we do by thinking about mediation tools um, offered to impaired people, we often accelerate a creative process for the whole exhibition making. In other words, a multi-century way to arts and culture is the gateway to a holistic approach in the culture mediation process. What we do are orientation plans, relief images, books, booklets, cartels, touchy artifacts, architecture models, and multimodal devices. Um, I will not go into detail about universal design, but I invite you to go on a website uh, about universal design. There are seven principles to it, um, which have been um, developed in the US in the, 19, in the 1970s. And um, they're very important, not only in the museum, uh, museum space. Um, learn and share. When we have an initial request that is often the design of a device for the visually impaired, we begin to think about all audiences. So we will design products that are primarily tactile, but also visual and educational. On the touch, touch stations, as you see here, one in the Louvre Abu Dhabi, we have elements in volume and relief, there's braille, but those are things that are initially for the blind, but in fact will generate a dialogue between especially children and adults. Um. <laughs> so you um, may have seen this already on our small booth here at the Congress Center. It's um, a book which will offer you informa to read information in the language of your choice. Um, or you would have us here, uh, we see a picture of the Museum Moussem in Marseille, a station where you can smell how a plant smells like. You can touch it and you can um, see it within a painting exhibited in this um, exhibition area. It is um, very important for us to work closely with the um, architectures, architects of our uh, exhibition space because we want to produce those touch stations in a way that they integrate in a very harmonic way and um, <coughs> to be permanently installed so that everyone can always come and touch and will not have to wait for a special guided tour um, especially for visually impaired people, can, that they can come whenever they want to and that they will not have to wait for a special tour offered to them. Um, sorry. So sometimes we even produce touch stations where you can touch things that 
you wouldn't even see as a snowflake. Have you ever touched a snowflake? Maybe, yes, you did, but have you ever seen one, probably? So here we have a touch station in uh, the Bundeskunsthalle, which is the Federal Art Museum of Germany in Bonn, um, where we were asked to produce a snow, uh, snowflake, um, and where we were told that snowflakes actually are um, objects of volume. Um, so we did produce an object in volume and made it possible, made it, um, yeah, experience um, to everyone. And um, that's uh, also the topic of our small project that I came to present here today, which is the Audio Tactile City Guide of Vienna, um, behind which the idea was to show parts of Vienna's buildings, most famous buildings, which none of us can actually really see or has, we have to get some information about those parts of the buildings um, in order to see them well. Um, you see here the cover page of our small book and I also brung, brought along a sample of one um, page that I will pass around or you can touch it at the booth. Um, and we want to uh, produce a small book that um, can be applied to uh, tours uh, through the city or that can be um, asked for at the tourist office where you can read information in Braille, but then you can also listen to it on either your own device via a QR code that you have to scan or on an audio guide that is handed to you in the office, in the tourist office. So here you would see one of those pages. Um, we have uh, selected uh, five buildings for our prototype that we are now um, producing together with the Hilfsgemeinschaft, um, the Zero Project, um, and the um, Association of the Blind and Visually Impaired of uh, Vienna and uh, Niederösterreich, part of Austria. Um, you see the church uh, of Vienna, maybe you have visited uh, this famous building, uh, St. Stephan's Dom, and there's a special bell in this building which uh, rings one um, several times a year, but especially on the 1st of January, uh, which is called Pummerin, and uh, which is very famous in Austria and very important to the Vienna people. Um, None of us, have, no one of us has ever really seen the bell properly, but we can listen to it. And we can now here touch um, the, the parts and the, the painting of it. We can also touch a part of the um, ceiling. Then uh, I show you some other examples of uh, the parliament. There's a nice story to it. Um, there's a figure on this uh, front of the parliament, um, which is the figure, the statue of the emperor um, in a nightgown, as told by the people of Vienna. No, it is not the case. This is a, a statue in an ancient Greek way, so this person is wearing a toga. But the Vienna people laughed very loud and said that this is the emperor in his nightgown. Um, yeah, we have, uh, as I said before, um, samples of this, and I have also brought along more samples of our work at the booth, and I very much invite you to come and touch, and let's get into touch. Thank you. I can't. Thank you, Linda. Uh, as far as I, I learned from you, we can go out to uh, in front of the of number one uh, and touch all these things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's read out loud too, or not? Yes, also, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Questions from the audience? Nope. Okay. So then let's pass to the next one. Uh, I don't have a cheat sheet for her, so I, I can't read any, <laughs> anything. It's no, no, I, I hope I spell it well. Um, Nofar, yes. Nofar Goren, from the Central Library for Brain and Reading Impaired uh, People in Tel Aviv. Uh, the next from Israel, and it's about the birth of audio description in Israel. <clears throat> and the floor is yours. 
Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Nofar. I am director of cultural accessibility at the Central Library for the Blind in Israel. And today I'm going to talk about the birth of audio description in Israel, which in fact is a beautiful project that uh, enables blind people and visually impaired to enjoy movies, theater shows, and performances. Uh, so in Israel, uh, the population, we have 24,000 people who are registered as blind, and estimates talks about 200,000 people who have low vision. But um, we don't have yet a law or regulation that enforced audio description in television, VOD, or live performances. We are working on it, and we, th we think it will take a few years, but there is not uh, yet a law. Um, although this is the situation, we have activity in the field of audio description. So uh, in 2014, uh, the first training course took place. So it combines um, three organizations. The Social Security Funds, which sponsored the project, the Central Library for the Blind, and also the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Uh, the course itself was in the university, and we invited um, specialists from the UK and for the, from the USA to train the new describers. Fourteen people came to the course, and today we have ten of them who are active regularly in movies, theater, shows, and uh, live performances. Um, along with the course, in the same year and also in 2015, um, we started the project by putting um, in 11 theaters all around Israel um, systems that uh, with the system, with this equipment, we can do the audio description. And the Central Library for the Blind was the organization that was in charge of operating it. Uh, the equipment itself uh, is based on the infrared system that is already exists in the theaters. So it includes a mixer, transmitter, receivers, and headphones, headsets. Um, so basically, you can do it uh, in this way, or the other way, we have a portable kit, which is exactly the same, but it uh, works on radio frequency. So we can go with this portable kit to other places that do not have the steady system. Um, our work uh, sequence, I will tell you a little bit about it. Um, at, the, at the beginning, we needed a pool of shows. So each person that came to the course did the internship, and in this way we had something like 20 uh, shows that were uh, like described uh, shows. Uh, we cooperate with the theaters, which means in order to write a um, descriptive script, we need the DVD of the play, the script of the play, and then we were, we're just working on it and we start to do more uh, accessible shows. And we chose um, shows who are, um, that we knew that are going to go all around the country. So in this way they can, I mean a lot of people can enjoy the description. And another main thing is that we chose um, shows that we can describe. I mean that you have a lot of visual aspects because as you know, there are a lot of um, shows that are all about uh, talking, talking, talking and in this way you cannot describe anything. So we chose mainly the ones that are with visual aspects. Um, one thing in our work sequence that we usually do and is really helpful for, helpful for us, it's a general rehearsal. So we take the DVD of the play and um, we take the describer and one volunteer, and we just do the description in front of the DVD. And in this way, uh, we actually get in some fine tuning. I mean, that we use the right words and we are okay with the timing, and it's really helpful for us. Um, another thing uh, that I want to talk about is the like, sequence at the evening of a uh, theater show. So what is happening that we, of course, we cooperate with the theaters, we tell them that we are coming and there is accessible show. Uh, we do touch tours, touch tours if 
someone do not know what it is. It's just the uh, people that are coming or go on the stage, they, they can feel the stage, they can hear the voices of the uh, actors, and it's really helpful, to, helpful for them to understand all about the play. Um, another thing are the pre-show notes. It's like five minutes, uh, five record, recorded minutes that uh, you can hear, and it's also it's about the play, it's about how the stage looks like, it's about the, um, the costumes, and a person that comes to accessible um, show can hear it five minutes before the show, he can hear it through our website, the library, library website, and um, also we can send it by mail via link. Uh, in 2015, uh, we launched the project, and it was very nice. 100 people, visually and blind people, visually impaired and blind people came, and it was good for us because it got into the media, and people that did not, didn't know about this project and this service uh, got to know about it. Uh, another thing which is important to us is the marketing. Uh, it's important for us that also sight, sighted people and also blind people will know about it, so we have posters all around the theaters. We um, publish in our website about the um, uh, accessible activity, the culture uh, activities that you can go each month. There are different um, activities. And um, in addition, we usually put it on forums. That way people can just hear and uh, hear about it and come. Um, we do all the time seminars in order to develop uh, these fields to other uh, things like opera, musicals, movies. And about uh, movies, it's of course another field, another field that we are dealing with. Uh, it's very popular. And what is important about um, uh, films in Israel that we do um, special screenings, which means um, People come and hear uh, in the hall the soundtrack, the accessible soundtrack, and the original soundtracks. And it's because in Israel we don't have headphones in the cinema halls. So everybody that comes enjoy the description. Um, another nice thing about it is that in the libra library website you can enjoy the um, audio descriptions and you can just borrow it like you borrow an uh, audiobook. We do also live performances, uh, which you can see in the pictures. Uh, and a little bit about the success in numbers. So we did more than 100 Israeli movies, 70 theater shows, 20 special events, and more than 1,000 blind people came and enjoy, enjoyed these uh, activities. Um, the success also um, brought a research uh, there is an academic research that is uh, still going on, and until now, um, people are really um, enjoyed the um, uh, description, and it's also very helpful. And 87 of them said that um, because they exposed exposed to the service, they will go now to other. Um, accessible uh, activity, mm -hmm. and it was good for them to understand the narrative of the, um, of the show, of the movie, and for us, it's really big, it's really amazing. Uh, there is here one response, but I think my time is up for, uh, one, okay, <laughs> so the red, I read. So one response from uh, Ricky, um, she was a viewer in one of our shows, uh, once again, I am amazed at how easily the uh, appropriate access makes me forget all about my disability on this occasion at the play home, at the handicap. Um, I have one more page about uh, conclusion, but one thing this, that is really important is to be in touch with uh, centers of blind people organization. This way they can come and encourage people to come and really uh, consume uh, the service. So, thank you very much. Thank you. I only want to mention that we have an, a similar, a similar uh, thing here in Austria. It's called Theater Fall. 
Uh, uh, perhaps it would be it would be nice if you connect to them. Uh. Okay. And nevertheless, we are running out of time. Uh, one one more participant. Uh, it's Orkem. I think it's a very important thing uh, for blind and visually impaired persons. Uh, it's a very important uh, development that we have seen within the last few years. Jennifer Kitzke from uh, Orkem. He is she. Sorry, sorry. She, 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 she is uh, uh, the area manager focused on North and Eastern Germany. Um, <clears throat> and she worked formerly, she worked at Chibo and Chibo startup company. Uh, she will now present the Orkham. Uh, <clears throat> the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the time slot. <laughs> Um, well, my name is Jennifer Kitzke, as I mentioned before, and I'm here from Germany. Um, Orchem Technology was um, founded in 2010 in uh, Jerusalem uh, by Professor Joshua and CEO Aviram, who are actually also the co-founders of Collision Avoidance System Mobile Eye. So the Orchem My Eye. Assistive technology device was launched in 2015 in the US and uh, subsequently in a growing number of countries. So there is a picture of both of us mm. and the background. Yeah. <laughs> I, by the way, I have a one. <laughs> okay. okay. So the story behind the scenes, uh, behind the foundation, was actually a family case um, by Professor Joshua himself. His wife's elderly aunt uh, pleaded with him uh, to find a proper solution to her vision loss. And well, let me say to you, um, mission started and still continues, of course. Um, Orkim is a life-changing device giving me independence and the ability to read again. That's a quote from one of our Orkham My i 2.0 users, uh, which um, describes pretty much what Orkham wants. Reading, for most of us, uh, the most normal thing in the world, but for those uh, for whom reading isn't something what they can do on their own, whether they have a reading disability or a visual disability, Orchem can give them new independence. Uh, the My Eye 2.0 is the world's most advanced wearable assistive artificial vision device uh, by now, and um, I'm holding it here in my hand. I have it around my neck. Just one second. That's it. So as you can see, it's wireless, um, it's uh, really light white and um, compact, just like the size of a finger when you see it in comparison to mine. So it's breakthrough assistive technology with a smart camera in the front with integrated LEDs, like here and an earpiece, the speaker, which mounts on almost every pair of glasses and discreetly fits um, onto your face. So, it get me prepared my glasses. And it is also a touch bar in the front to control the device, um, a power button to turn on and switch off, of course, and um, also a little microphone uh, to learn uh, faces or products, and um, also the magnets to fix it on your glasses, like this. Let me show it to you. So now you, that you can hear, let me shout out Berks. I have a pamphlet uh, from the SEER project just in my hands. And all you need to do is point. Just checking the Bluetooth speaker that you can hear it as well. Mm -hmm. no, it's yeah, I, I think so. Let's try it. No, it's still not connected. Volume now, now it's connected, so it works, as you can see. 
And now I can show you how it works. All you have to do is just point onto the text you want to read. Great business ideas go global to serve customers around the world. Social innovation too and often remains local or national. Many of the ideas... And with a simple stop gesture, you can control the device and stops reading. So, that's about reading. The MyEye 2.0 can also be connected to other devices, um, just like I did with the Bluetooth speaker in front of me. And besides the text reading, there are also some other features, such as face recognition, if I've mentioned before, and product identification. Well, in the following, I want to show you um, all the features um, Arkham offers and provides. And, um, well, if you um, want to read any printed or digital text, um, it doesn't matter if you want to read a book, uh, the newspaper, um, a street sign, or rather the menu in a restaurant, um, Arkham can read that all. So, moreover, uh, it is also real-time recognition of faces. You can store up to 150 um, faces of individuals. And face recognition, it's um, pretty difficult to uh, demonstrate here in a large room like this. Uh, but it works actually uh, very much the same way. Um, whenever a face comes into view, the camera will recognize the person and say the name immediately. So when the person is not um, stored in the device, it just uh, tells you um, a man or a woman is in front of you. Well, Orkim is able to uh, give independence and if you go to a supermarket, uh, pick an item um, off the shelf, um, using the product recognition technology, it's very simple. Um, even as the text uh, is stylized by marketing, uh, from Orkim's database, uh, it will tell you what kind of product it is. So, uh, let me tell you, when the product isn't stored in the device, uh, there's also a solution, of course, we are Orkim. Uh, it will work with a barcode. You just have to hold the product in front of you and it will tell you the product name. That's it, it's uh, pretty, uh, pretty simple. And in addition to that, my eye also detects money notes and um, colors as well. So it's uh, allowing people to explore the world, um, really living in their environment and finding work all independently. So, uh, like you can see, it's a great variety of features and Actually, it's all about making information uh, accessible to anyone. By now, by now, we um, the device is available in 13 different uh, languages in 30 countries, and even more are following. Of course, uh, we have English, French, Spanish, German. Of course, I'm from Germany, Italian. Dutch, Swedish, Norwegian, Danish, Finnish, Flemish, Portuguese, and Hebrew, of course, it's an Israeli company. Uh, it's a device which uh, can help all over the world, so that's why we're looking forward to working with even more countries in the near future, and also being available in even more languages, of course. Well, Occam puts a lot of effort and investigation in new technology. And these are pretty much the basics um, about the company, about Orkham. And I know, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't show all the features in detail, and, uh, in detail but uh, I invite you all to come to our booth and uh, yeah, try it out and see for yourself. Um, experience or come and thank you very much. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I think one of the most important questions everybody is asking here is how much does it cost? Wow. Yeah, of course, pretty good question, very important one.
Of course, um, in Austria, it's 4,500 euro uh, before tax. And actually, it's a similar price point um, um, translated into other places in the world. Yes. So um, yeah, it's pretty much it's similar. Yeah, it's expensive, but uh, it has a variety of features as well. Questions from the audience? No questions? Okay. So, if there are any questions for the, for the other uh, speakers that we have before? No? Yes, one question. Uh, now it works. Uh, I have a question to the audio description. Um, who, uh, what about finance? Finance. Who um, does the theaters pay for the service or the customers? Or? Okay, I will explain. Um, you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, for the equi equipment, the social security paid. And each theater that got the equipment um, paid uh, for two accessible shows in return in some way. Uh, but now um, the Central Library for the Blind is paying for it from donation. And we are constantly working on it that uh, also the government or official offices will also be part of it. So, but. And, now we are managing it. Also, the theaters are given a reduced prices for the blind and visually impaired, so it's a little bit helping to encourage people to come. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So, because we are five minutes over time or six minutes over time, uh, I will now close the session. Uh, okay. Thank you all very much for being thank present for uh, for these presentations and for uh, the wonderful audience. Uh, See you tomorrow. <laughs>